Welcome to a tutorial on sequencers. As you can see in front of you, I already have a basic example set up which utilizes the SQI sequencer input as well as the SQOO sequencer output instruction in RSLogic slash Studio 5000. We are of course running on the same processor that we did for multiple videos, the L24ER QB1B version 30.11 processor. And in this video, we're going to be talking about a basic implementation of a sequencer. And then we're going to jump into a much more complex implementation, which is going to be involved in a tank system, which has multiple ingredients feeding into it has a couple of different feeders, as well as some heating capabilities and we're going to effectively build that from scratch and I'm going to be walking you step by step through the implementation so that you can understand this instruction very well and how it plays a very important role in certain applications. Before we get started with today's video, we just wanted to quickly point out all the great content we've been releasing on the Solus PLC YouTube channel. And this includes industrial automation, PLC programming, as well as HMI development. And if you enjoy this type of content, we would really appreciate it if you could click the subscribe button as well as the notification bell in order to receive the latest and greatest content we will be posting to the channel. All right, so let's explore the very basic implementation of sequencers. So this is a fairly straightforward example. As you can see, I have three rungs over here, then I have the two instructions, and then I have three rungs underneath them. And the reason why they're positioned like so is because my three conditions at the top are going to be my inputs and the three uh, conditions or essentially the conditional outputs are going to be at the bottom. And all this does is so for example, if we're in position one, as you can see, based on both sequencers, there's going, they're going to be in position one. Once I give them the permissive, which is going to be this instruction over here, so I've toggled this, this travels into position two, and in position two, the output, which is going to be energized, is going to be sequencer output number two. Then once I untoggle this, nothing else happens until the second condition is met. Once the second condition is met, and I'm toggling this, by the way, with the control and T uh, keyboard shortcuts on my keyboard, you can also right click and you can toggle this bit. So that's to turn it off. As you can see, once we're in position three, the last output is energized. And once I energize the third condition, so I'm going to toggle this manually and I untoggle it, then we are back to sequencer output one. So as you can probably already tell, this replaces the usual uh, so to give you an example, what you will see in many different programs, you have some kind of a start, so sequence start push button, so there's going to be a push button which starts this and then you use a move instruction. So for example, let's do let's do a very simple, basic um, implementation of a sequencer without using the proper instruction. So this is sequence position, somebody would write something like this, and this is going to be a uh, for example, a dent within the this routine. So we're going to create that. So once the sequence starts, you do a one, and then you use a comparison here on the next rung. So let's make this, this is going to be a Boolean. This is going to be equal. So if sequence position is equal to one, then you're going to say, for example, system one turn on, or let's say output one turn on. And then you wait for a certain condition to be met. So when the condition is met, and this condition, for example, is going to be, I don't know, level reach, let's say, let's do a GRT. So when, for example, tank level greater than 20%, then you have the move instruction that's going to do a two into the sequence, so on and so forth. So essentially you're going through step by step and then you're allowing certain outputs to energize, you know, then you repeat again. So if it's equal now to two, then you, uh, you energize output two and you continue going until you reach a certain level of, um, of your sequence. And then you say, hey, at this point, you know, the tank or the sequence has been completed, then now you need to move this zero. So you're moving a zero back into the sequencer position. And effectively, that allows you to restart the sequence all over again. And usually what you also need to do is, of course, a comparison instruction at the beginning here. So equal 
if the sequence position is equal to zero, then you allow it to move it to one, and then this takes care of itself. You know, step by step, you go through step one, then you go through step two, step three, so on and so forth. But what this essentially leaves you with is a lot of different code, which uh, may or may not execute in the exact manner that you would like. And it's essentially very unpredictable and somewhat unprofessional to write it this way. Therefore, you should be utilizing the sequencers. That being said, sequencers are a little bit more complex. So typically, if you have a process which involves, you know, maybe two and three steps, which are in a sequential order, just, you know, one to one, then there's not a whole lot of sense to go through the implementation of a sequencer. You can just use the basic example that I gave you. But if you have a tank system which has multiple inputs, multiple outputs, it's reading different temperatures, it's reading, you know, different levels, then it's highly, highly advantageous. One thing that I do want to show you is that there's also going to be arrays, mask, sources, and controls. So those uh, those arrays as well as dints are very, very important. So let's go and take a look at them. So first of all, the sequence mask. So the sequence mask tells us that we're looking, we're only interested in the four bits at the very beginning. Everything else is zero, so when the mask is zero essentially we simply tell the processor that we don't care about the state of those bits we're only concerned about the first four now we also wanted to look at the sequence let's go sequence array first so sequence array zero is going to essentially tell us which inputs are required at which position in order to transition to the next state and to make it really clear so what I've done here, as you can probably tell by the numbers, they are essentially powers of two. So two to the power zero is going to be one. Uh, two to the power one is going to be two. Two to the power two, so two times two, four, and two times two times two is going to be eight. So that means if you expand this in Boolean logic, we're only looking for a single input, which is going to be the next input to be true in order to transition into that state, which is the most basic implementation. That being said, a lot of times you have multiple conditions which are required for a certain a certain transition of state. So for example, if you have an ingredient which is feeding into a tank, let's say in a brewing process, then perhaps you also need to maintain a certain temperature level or you need to reach a certain temperature level before you, you can start adding the next ingredient so you want to have the condition of getting the ingredient to a certain level and having a certain temperature reached right so for example you can't necessarily just allow the uh the process to continue until those two conditions are met so this is where sequencers become very flexible where um let's let's take this as an example so i've expanded this little too but instead of looking for this just the second input we're also going to look at the third one so let's take a look at how that changes our condition so remember that first we transitioned by toggling this one now it's no longer transitioning into position two and the reason for that is because we are looking at the array for the different positions so now we're looking for bit for this one and this two and that's how it allows us to transition to that next step so you can already see how how very how you can make this extremely extremely complex yet at the same time this is all residing within your array so you know exactly what's going on at every stage and you can very easily go back into those arrays and transition those into different states and the same applies to our outputs so the outputs also have this output mask an output array which essentially tell them which outputs to turn on in which state so let's look at that as well so i'm going to monitor those bits as well and we have just like i did before we have the same exact sequence where we're energizing you know this one output on one then we're energizing this one on two so let's change this up a little bit and we're going to put a one here and then see how that looks so now let's I believe we do need to still toggle through some of those conditions. So the conditions do need to toggle out and then toggle back in as you just saw me do. But essentially, let's toggle both of these since we need to transition to that state. And as you can see in position number two, not only did we require two specific inputs to be true, but we also sent outputs to two specific outputs. So it becomes extremely flexible. You can mix and match which outputs are going to be energized in which state and which inputs are required for which state. So 
a very, very cool application here. And what we're going to do in the next step is essentially toggle all of this stuff. We're not only going to toggle, but we're going to build an application which is going to be applied for a tank system. Yet we're going to improvise a little bit, but we're going to expand this to a higher level. So what we're going to start off with is we're going to give this a little bit more length. So the length defines how many steps we have. And let's, for example, build seven steps in both the sequencer output and input. And let's think about this application just a little bit. So at first, uh, I'm going to put some comments. So in my first input, this is going to be essentially the start of the system. So begin batch processing. So begin batch processing and this takes as an input which is going to be just a simple push button. So this we can give it an, a label as well. So this is a batch start button. It could be a latch on the PLC side. It could be it could be anything. It doesn't really need to be any specific hardware button, but it does start start the batch. Once the batch is started, we need to begin outputting ingredients. And let's see here. So if we're in so normally we should be in in position zero once we start this. And I think we need to just transition through, let's see here. Because we've played with that array a little bit. So now we need to essentially get back into our state. Let's see here. So so I'm just trying to cycle through the sequencer to get all the way back at the at the input. So this is... Okay, so this is the very beginning. So this is where we're going to require the push button. And this is going to be our condition, which is output tank ready for batch. So this is going to be like a green light, for example, on an HMI system, or just a display for the operator to tell them that, hey, the tank is ready for a batch. Once we press the start button, we should be able to begin a batch. That being said, we also want to change the array so we're going to go back into this array this is going to be just a simple push button so let's see here instead of being let's see so we're going to put this back at just that one setup and this is going to be so the next output that we want to energize we also don't want to energize two specific outputs we want to energize just one output. So I'm going to just minimize this a little bit. And let's go to array number two. And I believe it's going to be this one here. So we're going to energize just one single output for now. And so once we push the start button, we need to start feeding a certain ingredient. So this is sequencer output, which is now starting to feed an ingredient. And ultimately, this is tied into a certain valve. So now we've opened a certain valve and imagine that a certain ingredient, so this could be a certain liquid which is pouring into the tank. This could be water, for example, and it needs to be uh, it needs to be working. Now, these conditions, like for example, I've labeled this as a push button. Ultimately, these conditions don't need to be just an XIC. So here, our next condition, instead of being an XIC, I'm going to edit this rung and it's going to be a greater than so greater than is an instruction that you've seen me go over but basic instruction let's say this is our tank level tank level greater than 30 percent so remember that now our tank is filling with water we need to fill the water until it's 30 percent or let's say let's say we're going to we're going to call this as ingredient one set point Let's just um, let's just make that a dent. Let's see here. This is going to be a dent residing here, and this is going to be also a new, and this is going to be a dent residing here. So once the tank level is greater than thirty percent, that's when we're going to confirm that the level of water has essentially been satisfied. So we've gotten enough water, and at this point, we need to transition to the next step, right? So at this point we can just 
compile that in. And what's going to be our next step? So once we've gotten enough water, now, for example, we need to add a second ingredient. So for example, this could be, I don't know, molasses, this could be, um, this could be just any different liquid, right? So we've, we've transitioned from here. And let's, um, let's actually energize this. So we're going to energize this. And we're going to definitely the push button is going to be an on latch. And now we're in this next condition, right? So we've turned off the valve for water. So we no longer we're no longer requesting water. So that has been cut off. But now we're looking for a next ingredient. So let's do this. We're going to label this ingredient to valve open. And of course, this is very easy to understand. We're just toggling through ingredients, but this is where things are going to get a little bit interesting. So now that we have a second ingredient, let's think about we need to not only just pour ingredients in, but now we need to start mixing. So in this stage, once we've gotten here, not only do we need to open the valve, but we also need to start mixing our ingredients. So here, of course, there's going to be an ingredient to set point as well. So there's going to be multiple conditions. So there's going to be ingredient to set point, which is going to be a dent, just like before. And let's say this is going to be up to 50%. So once 50% is reached, we should be okay. Let's do it like this. But we also, like I said, we have a second output. And the common mistake that people do is they're going to just go into the sequencer output three, they're going to put a branch out of this, and then they're going to drive a second output. This is not the right way that you should be working with sequencers. The right way would be to incorporate the next output, which is going to be output number four in this case. So we're going to put in sequencer output number four, and let's just give it a another condition. So this is going to be output number four, right? So now it's not enabled, but we will take care of that really quickly. And this is going to be a condition which is going to be enable stir. And the stir is essentially a VFD, uh, VFD motor, or, you know, some kind of a motor which stirs inside of the tank. And that's going to be enabled by this specific output. So hopefully that uh, that makes sense. It's not enabled right now. But um, bear with me, we're going to go back into the array right here. Let's see monitor this array and this is going to be our array number two so instead of just enabling that dot two we're going to enable the dot three as well and of course it's not going to reset until we kind of go through this again let's see here so if we're back at one so imagine the tank level is back at zero we press the start button we press the start button our ingredient one and ingredient two are open that's not right so let's go back into the sequencer and monitor this so i put them in the wrong array so this needs to be zero and then the number three is going to have a one so let's uh that's why it's very important to test because a lot of times these are not always obvious and usually you'd write this down in an excel spreadsheet so that it's a little bit more manageable so the button gets pressed and unpressed so now we have water pouring in. So let's just uh, water. Liquid number two. So water is pouring in. Liquid two is not pouring in. So the water is pouring in. The tank level, which again, we're just simulating this in our software, but essentially the tank reaches, let's say 30.01. 30 um, it's a dense, so let's say it reaches 30. And then now we have liquid two, which is pouring in. But for some reason, this should also be enabled. It's kind of. Hmm. Let's go back into our array and look what's going on here. Oh yeah, it's because of course we didn't. We didn't look at the mask. So the mask, I believe, is still masking just those four. So we can give it a little bit more. Uh, space let's go all the way up to 16 inputs and then we're also we need to change the mask on the other one so let's let's go back and change the masks i was playing with only four inputs and four outputs in my other one so that's the reason why oh and the mask is the same in both okay so let's go back so the tank level is back to zero we are back in position one which is just waiting for the start button so let's start the tank 
Now valve, valve one is open for our water input. Once we get to tank level 31, we have now transitioned. And as you can see now, we are pouring in the second liquid and we're also steering the tank. Now, the next step, let's just make it very simple. We have another ingredient which needs to be added. So there's going to be ingredient number three. And this is going to be ingredient number three, but it's going to be output number five. So here is going to be number five. And it's going to be condition number five as well. So this is going to be some kind of a, you know, weight belt. So weight belt. So it's going to be essentially a uh, solid that we're adding to. So think of like hops, for example, if you're making beer or something like that. Hops feeder enabled. So this is going to be the next ingredient which comes in. And at this point, we need to keep stirring, but we also need to add, we also need to add this ingredient. And we also need to monitor the tank level. So the tank level is definitely going to go, let's say this one is going to be up to 99. So it's going to fill the tank completely. And then this is going to be four. And that's going to be the next ingredient but we also want so once all the ingredients have been added we want to definitely stop the output but then we need to monitor the temperature so the next stage is going to be looking for temperature so let's do this five so we're looking for temperature so instead of looking at the tank level now we're looking at the tank temperature so we have some kind of a heating system which is enabled at the end of all of that process so imagine we've put in water we've put in uh, maltodextrin for example and then we've put in something else thank you guys so much for watching my content if you have any questions on this topic make sure to leave them in the comment section below and if you can spend five seconds of your time liking as well as sharing that video if you've enjoyed it that would mean absolutely the world to me and if you have any suggestions for the channel what kind of hardware software i should be covering then make sure to leave that down there as well see you next time take care bye